Hello, uh, thanks for coming to this talk. My name is Mario. I'm going to talk about our contributions at Igalia to the Chromium open source project in the past year and a half. So first, an introduction about me. I'm a computer science engineer. I'm a partner of Igalia as well, and a member of his Chromium team. I'm involved as different uh, as part of different open source communities as well, like the Chromium community, obviously, but also WebKit and the GNOME project. And also in the past, I did other work not related to web engines and browsers, like the development of Linux-based operating systems or the Samsung Smart TV platform. And a long time ago, I also worked on Nokia's MyMo project as part of the APT and Hilton Application Manager components mainly. About Igalia, also some introduction. We are a highly specialized open source consultancy company. We run on an entirely flat structure and we are headquartered in A Coruña, the northwest of Spain, in Galicia. We have an office in there, but we are actually more than 100 people working from all over the world across 25 countries and 11 time zones. And we have different teams that are mostly related to browsers and web engines in a way or another. Like for instance, the Chromium, the WebKit and the web platform teams are the obvious ones. And then the compilers teams where they, where they also work on JavaScript engines and, and then also graphics, multimedia and accessibility where they do work not just for web browser, but also related to it. So what is Chromium, first of all? Chromium is a standalone free and open source web browser, pretty much like Firefox, for instance. It's licensed under the terms of the BSD license mostly, although for historical reasons, there are some bits still under the MIT, LDPL, or TPL, or other licenses as well. It's available for different platforms like Windows, Mac, Linux, iOS, or Android. And it has been designed right from the start with a multi-process and modular architecture in mind. Uh, in particular, the simplifying things a bit, we, we have here a browser process that deals with the entire application and then at least one process per tab that we call a renderer process. And the idea is that if a tab crashes, it doesn't crash the entire browser. And this about modular architecture, the, the most important module here is probably the content module, which is the one that you would use uh, for embedding if you want to create a Chromium based browser. And this content module is split in two parts, content browser and content renderer, implementing different sides of the multiprocess architecture, as I said before. Also Chromium is used as the base for several browsers out there, like Google Chrome, obviously, but also Samsung Internet Browser, Microsoft Edge, Opera, UC Browser, Brave, many others. And because of this reason, it achieved a market share of over 70% as of April 2021. Not just Google Chrome, I insist, but all of them together. Another interesting data point is that it, grow, it grew very fast over the past 10 years. It moved from being nothing in 2009 to this point where it is right now. And, and that's, that's about market share. So what is the difference between Chromium and Chrome? Chrome and Chromium are both free as in free beer, as you don't have you don't have to pay for them. But only Chromium is fully open source in that you can build and modify it. Chrome is based on Chromium, obviously, and adds, unfortunately, some close parts on top. Those parts include things like the automatic updater, API keys for Google services, or support for Netflix or non-free multimedia codecs. Because of this reason, Chrome cannot be built and cannot be freely redistributed either, like Chromium, like, like, like what is possible with Chromium. Obviously, there are different branding as well, and not just the name, but also the icon, as you can see here. Trying to give a visual uh, idea of both browsers, you can see that it's very hard to distinguish which one is which, because unless you go to the Chrome version page and you look into the different branding elements, it's pretty much identical. So I said that Chromium is the whole browser, but obviously it doesn't do everything on its, on its own. Chromium uses Blink as the web engine to render web content. Blink will be then the component that uh, takes HTML and CSS code, parses it, and decides where to show up and how to show up content on the screen, how to respond to user interactions, and even implement JavaScript APIs. And as, as it comes for JavaScript APIs, it is necessary to execute JavaScript code at some point. So for that, Blink relies on the V8 JavaScript engine, which is what we use in Chromium. So this V8 uh, JavaScript engine is therefore responsible for executing JavaScript code, but it's also interesting to know that it can be run independently of Chromium as well. And it's actually the base of Node.js, if you're familiar with it. So trying to give a visual uh, idea of what each part is. So imagine you have a browser rendering a web page. 
So in this particular case, the entire window will be Chromium, the entire application with the tabs and the back and forth forward buttons. Then the content renderings for the tab will be uh, Blink and V8 that will be in charge of running uh, JavaScript code. Like for instance, what it will execute if you click on the play button here. So yeah, basically Blink and V8 will be uh, in charge of rendering the web content and Chromium will be the entire thing. And just to finish this introduction, what is Chromium OS? You might have heard of it. Chromium OS is a full operating system built on top of Chromium, so not just a browser, but also the components necessary to put the machine and implement implement a modern desktop environment. Like for instance, session management, suspension and resume, uh, hardware detection, win a window in system, everything is implemented by Chromium OS here. And like Chromium versus Chrome, only Chromium OS is fully free in that you can build it and modify it. An interesting thing, an interesting difference between Chromium and Chrome is that while it's very easy to these days to use a Chromium based browser, just not, not just Google Chrome, but also Microsoft Edge or Samsung Internet Browser or Brave, it's not that easy to use a Chromium OS based machine because Chromium OS is mostly popular via the so-called Chromebooks that you can buy in a shop. But nothing stops you from getting one of those machines and building Chromium OS yourself, major modifications, and, and basically create your own version of Chromium OS, which will look basically like this. So it, I know it, it looks like just a browser, but it, you have to consider that in this particular case, Chromium is not, is not just rendering the, the browser window, but everything else, the wallpaper, the bottom panel, the clock, the system menu, everything is Chromium OS. And with that, Introduction out of the way. Um, let's go back to the topic of this talk and, and talk about what we at Igalia have contributed to the project in the past year and a half. So the first project I want to talk about is the Code Health effort. This is a big effort across the Chromium project that has different sub projects. So in our particular case, we started working on the so-called Onion Soup project, which is, uh, well, the, the reason of this name is because this project is about removing layers and you know onions have a lot of layers so this is the idea so the the more advanced idea is that as i said before you have the browser and the renderer process in the case of chromium and they communicate together through ipc so the idea of this project is that at the moment if you want to communicate from the browser process with the web engine with blink you have to travel through a lot of layers first you have to go to content renderer and then from content render, you have to traverse lots of layers to Blink. And those layers and those APIs made sense back in the day when Blink was actually not Blink, but WebKit, where it, because Blink was, is a fork of WebKit. It made sense back in the day because WebKit was meant to be used by different embedders. But in the case of Chromium, Blink is only meant to be used by content renderers. So those different layers don't make that much sense anymore. So the idea here is, to identify parts of content renderer that could be actually moved directly into Blink and then move them, which will allow us to remove all these uh, unnecessary layers and APIs that are basically complicating things these days. So, so far in the context of this project, we, we did a lot of work in content renderer media directory. We finished WebRTC, audio, peer connection. We did work on content renderer Java directory as well and, and content renderer accessibility. And we started moving the media Blink directory as well into Blink. And this process helped remove more than 200 definitions, not just classes and enumerations, but also entire files from Blink's public API. Also in the context of code health and related to onion soup, we have this other sub project called legacy IPC migrations. So the idea here is that uh, in, in Chromium, because you have different processes, you need IPC to communicate among them. So Chromium started using what now is is known as the legacy IPC APIs. And that had a lot of problems. One of the problems was that in order to communicate between the browser process and, and, and other components, like for instance, Blink, you would have to go through content renderer. Uh, this means that as you can, as, if you think of the previous slide, you may already realize that uh, this is a blocker for the Onion Soup project because you cannot move a module from content renderer down into Blink if that module is meant to communicate with the browser process. If you, if once move into Blink, you won't be able to, to establish some IPC mechanism directly between browser process and Blink. And this is what Mojo allows. So because of the reasons we worked on the migration of many legacy IPC messages, about 500 when we started. And at the, at this moment, we are happy to say that the content module is nearly migrated. Only three messages remain and migrations outside of content 
the content directory have progressed as well very well. We are about 25% progress in there and mostly focused right now on the extension directory. Uh, so for another thing, so another topic, CSS, our web platform team, as usual, has been working on CSS. They implemented and ship uh, the market pseudo element and, and some specs like CSS flow relative shorthand and offset properties. They also improve the performance of CSS custom properties and make changes to CSS test, line breaking, and new, and new, new text break iterators default behavior. Uh, for CSS Grid, uh, if you are not familiar, if we at Igalia implemented this specification back in the day for Chromium. And in this period, we spend most time doing maintenance, fixing bugs, and interoperability and performance issues. We also started working on CSS scroll bars and implemented changes to different pseudo classes like Focus, Visible, Has, and Dear. For accessibility, we enabled Linux accessibility mode on the fly in this during this period. This this was a big deal because back in the day, well before this change, if you were if you if you needed to use a screen reader on Linux, for instance, and and you needed to use it with with Chromium, you would have to start Chromium first, enable accessibility, and then restart, and that was not great. So with this change, now Chromium auto detects if, whether accessibility is enabled in the desktop, and you don't have to do anything; it just works. We also added support for more event types in Linux. And we improve uh, accessibility debug tools as well, not just for Mac, but also extended cross-platform support and enable accessibility tools so that they work not just with the Chromium uh, browser, but also with other web engines, which is great. My colleague, Alex Urkov, wrote a blog post in detail on this topic if you're interested. We also reported and fixed many bugs across desktop platforms uh, related to Chromium UI and enhanced the Chrome history page and many items support on Mac. Jacobo, my colleague Jacobo, wrote a blog post on this as well. We also improved support for the Shadow DOM and Flat Tree navigation for carrot browser navigation. Carrot browser navigation, if you're not familiar with it, is what we call when you can move throughout the test in a web page, moving a tiny little cursor with your with the arrow keys. This is very useful if you use a screen reader because, because it allows you to uh, tell the screen reader please read this specific word to me or this line or this paragraph. And so it's fairly important. We also imported tens of tests for accessible name calculation and did some general maintenance here as well. For Chromium on Wayland, this is a huge topic, so I'll try to explain it very briefly here. Uh, the idea is that um, you have to consider that in the, in the Linux desktop, as in other desktops, we have a windowing system. But in the particular case of Linux, we have had uh, the X windowing system in place for more than 30 years now. And that was that was perfectly fine when it was designed, but uh, currently it's uh, the, X, the X windowing system has some problems that the Wayland project is trying to overcome. The Wayland project has started uh, about 10 years ago, more or less, maybe a little bit less. And so the idea in Igalia was to provide Chromium with native support for this other windowing system. Why was that? Because Chromium, even today, it runs on Linux natively only on the X windowing system. You can still use it on a Wayland environment, but what happens is that it will use a wrapper called X Wayland and, not, and will not run natively, which is not great, for instance, for uh, resource constrained devices like uh, some embedded devices. So what we did here was to tackle this problem, but it, instead of just implementing uh, Wayland support in a similar way to how X windowing system was supported, we took another uh, layer called Awesome, which is an abstract, abstraction layer that allows you to uh, to select different backends, depending on whether you want to use X, Wayland, or other windowing systems. So what we did, we started years ago on working on the Olson Wayland backend, and we made it fully upstream in 2018 already. So once that was ready, the next step was to create another X windowing backend. X11 is the name of the protocol, so that, sorry about the, the confusion. So we created another X backend for, for Olson, uh, started working on that in the middle of 2019, and, and moved it to a point where where much of the code is now shared between that Ozone X11 backend and the non Ozone X11 implementation in Chromium. We reached a point where then in 2020, we managed to, to get things in, in good shape or in good enough shape so that you can now take an official Chrome release and just by passing a couple of runtime flags, you can actually use Ozone on Linux and decide whether you want to use X11 or Wayland platforms. And last but not least, we recently, a couple of weeks ago, uh, activated a Finch trial for Ozone X11, which means that users are now using this uh, system, even without explicitly, some users only, even without explicitly selecting it. 
More things on this, we also developed along the way an extension for the Wayland drag and drop protocol because the, the Wayland drag and drop protocol was not enough, good enough for Chromium's needs. We implemented it in EXO and we have a proposal for, a standardiz for a standardizing it upstream in Wayland protocols. So the next obvious step right now will be to have a successful Finch trial for, for us on Wayland so that we can get users trying it as well. And once Ozone awesome Wayland Finch trial succeeds and Ozone awesome 11 X11 Finch trial succeeds as well, we should be able to make Ozone awesome the default on Linux, ideally at some point during the second half of 2021. This is a big topic, as I said. If you are interested, please check out my colleague Alex's talk at the Web Engine Hackfest, and you will have far more details on the topic. So MathML, uh, my colleagues from the web platform team work as well on the implementation of, of this specification. Uh, during this period, what we did was to upstream a lot of uh, some da downstream work we did on 2019 related to it, and I started to upstream support for stretch operators, which are the ones that you can see, if you see the animation above, the, the operators for integrals and square roots are stretch operators. And you can see in this animation how the rendering of the same formula has been changing uh, throughout the changes uh, that we contributed to the, to the Chromium code base. For the JavaScript engine, V8, our compiler's team implemented and shipped uh, the JavaScript private methods proposal and improved the startup snapshot API to integrate better with Node.js. We are currently working on optimizing the JavaScript public and private class fields. Uh, I have a link here to the design doc if you want to check it out. And during this period, we provided uh, 15 patches to the V8 repository and two more are currently under review. I'm, I'm not an expert on this area, so I'm sorry, but uh, if you are interested, you are, you are free to, to go to these patches and check them out or even contact them, contact us for, for more information. We also work, uh, started recently working on the so-called Lacrosse project, which stands for Linux and Chrome OS. So the idea here is that the Chrome OS operating system is, is, is nice, but it has a big problem, which is that the Chrome, the Chrome browser uh, that runs on it right now only gets updates along with the operating system. And this is not good because usually you want to get updates for your browser much faster to fix security vulnerabilities and things like that. So the idea of this project is to decouple the Chrome browser from the operating system and, and have a an standalone binary just for the browser that you can update. So this is an ongoing effort. We started very recently working on it. So far, we improved integration with the window manager, maximizing, minimizing, things like that, uh, snapping windows. We added multiple display support and fractal scaling on high DPI, which is work in progress. And we also started working on a large refactoring to better split the code between the, the code currently on the Chrome OS directory into specific directories called as for operating system specific code and lacrosse for code specific to the standalone browser that we are trying to build. And we also did some general bug fixing and improvements. And the last big project we started collaborating with is called Multiple Page Architecture. This is very recent. We started just uh, a few weeks ago, I think. And the idea here is that there are several use cases where you want to have uh, multiple pages render in the context of just one tab. Like for instance, if you have iframes or web view, in internal web views, or if you have a portals or rendering, those are cases where you want to render different pages in the same tab. The problem is that right now, Different, those different use cases use one of these two different approaches. Either the tab has one web contents instance with multiple pages, or the tab has multiple web contents instances with only one page each. So the idea of this project is to unify the, all the use cases to just use the first approach. That is, to have one web contents object with multiple pages inside of it. This is a work in progress. Uh, it's a very big task. Uh, if you are interested in this topic, I recommend you to check Lucas Garani's talk at Blinkon 14 just a few days ago. And all, nearly at the end, we also did some work related to interoperability between browsers and web engines. Uh, in particular, we fixed the Chromium behavior to align with the specs and other browsers implementations of a couple of features. And we also migrated Chromium specific web tests to the web platform test project. What is this about? So Chromium, like other web engines, have a massive test suite of, of tests to make sure that uh, it doesn't break the implementation of the web platform. So what we did here was to audit many of those tests and try to figure out which ones could be, could, could be uh, promoted, could be contributed to this other project called Web Platform Tests. 
And why is that? Because web platform tests is used not just by Chromium, but also by Firefox and WebKit. So what this means is that we managed to migrate to 240 tests that were Chromium specific. And those 240 tests are now also being run by Firefox and WebKit, which improves interoperability between browsers. We also investigated 96 tests that decided that were too Chromium specific, but still uh, with this process, dur during this process, we managed to identify missing features and bugs that we reported to other web engines. And besides that, we also did some other contributions like protocol handlers and extensions that I, I cannot really go into detail here. And last but not least, not a code contribution, but I think it's important one as well. We added nine new egalians during this period to work upstream on Chromium. Uh, also added three new owners, which uh, an owner is a specific kind of uh, contributor in Chromium that is allowed to accept or reject code in a specific directories that they own. And we also had a new API owner. An API owner doesn't review code. The, the role of the API, API owner is to have a say on the acceptance of uh, changes to the Blink implementation of the web platform in Chromium. And so it's a fairly important role as well. And that's, sorry for the for too much information, but this is just, um, it's, it's a lot of data in just a few minutes. So just to finish some some statistics, I would like to share with you some numbers. So during this period, these 18 months, we landed about 3,500 patches to the Chromium repository, just to the Chromium repository. This doesn't account for V8. So as you can see, it has been a steady, uh, an steady rate of contributions throughout the months, and it doesn't look like it's stopping anytime soon. We did all these patches uh, just by, uh, they were made by 33 galleons that landed patches in many different areas. And this number, by the way, doesn't account, as I say, for V8. So you have to account for two more people that contributed to the V8 repository only. Now trying to give a bigger context. Uh, well, first of all, we need to be clear on that Google's contribution to Chromium project are still very big, like about 92% in total. But outside Google's contribution, we are very happy and proud to say that Igalia has been steadily, for the past years, for the past few years, we have been the top non-Google contributor in the in number of commits. We are Microsoft is, is is catching up very quickly, which makes sense because they just started uh, using Chromium for Edge a couple of years ago, and and they are they are closing the gap that gap quite quickly. But it's still quite good, I think, quite good numbers. If you look not just into Chromium but more into the Chromium ecosystem of projects, which include also V8 and WPT and WebRTC and things like that, then you can see we are still quite uh, quite big, like 22% in the case of Igalia, and Microsoft again very big and other contributors. In this particular case, Microsoft already surpasses in the last period, which is perfectly understandable because. Uh, it's actually, it's a company with way more contributors to the project. And actually that's the reason why we are definitely not the top non-Google contributor by team size. We are, I think, fifth in the last two periods, but that's perfectly fine. It's not a problem. This is not a competition. This is good for, for diversity of the project and for the diversity, uh, for the health of the web platform. And as you can see in the chart on the right, the, the truth is that diversity in the project has been also steadily increasing in the past few years, which are good news as well. Still, a lot of uh, contributions come from Google, but if this continues going as it is right now, the, we, we will have a more diverse web platform, a more, more diverse Chromium project in the, in the next years. And that is all from my side. I just wanted to put this last slide to acknowledge the effort of all my colleagues that contributed to the work that I presented in this, in this, in this talk. And if you have any question, uh, you have my email, you can contact me by email, you can find me on my blog as well, or in other places on the internet like Twitter and GitHub. And that is all. Um, thank you. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I hope you, you got some useful information out of it. Thank you.